Great. Okay, I think we should get started because I think we've got quite a lot of things to cover. And I know we want to get some exciting case studies and uh, Q&A at the end. So welcome, everyone. And thank you for joining our conversation today around financial crime and AML regulation. By way of introduction, I'm Isabella Roberts, one of the product specialists at Neotas. As many of you know, Neotas are the investigative due diligence firm and experts in OSINT, that is open source intelligence. Now the uh, poll is kind of evening out now, but we've, oh, it's now 50-50 of do you currently use OSINT in your business? Um, I was gonna say how many of you are familiar with OSINT or um, have used it yourselves um, so far? We have some exciting case studies, um, including how he helped a wealth manager avoid accepting money from a convicted murderer. Whilst we also deal with slightly more vanilla cases, we're looking forward to showcasing the power of OSINT, especially in the fight against financial crime. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our expert panel, Vipul Mishra, co-founder of Neotas, Craig Fitzpatrick, Corporate Intelligence Director in the Forensics Team at PwC, and Mike Harris, an independent consultant with 30 years of financial crime experience at FCC Consulting. For a bit of background, Vipul is a cybersecurity risk and legal investigations expert with a proven track record of detecting and navigating complex fraud, financial crime, computer crime, and intellectual property cases. Vipul has played pivotal roles in successful litigations resulting in extradition and prosecution of offenders. International background spans investment banking, hedge funds and government. Craig leads PwC's corporate intelligence team in the UK and has led multiple significant international projects in the, internet, in the intelligence field for over 15 years, specialising open source investigations and third party due diligence programmes for companies across a range of industries. And Mike, formerly Director of Financial Crime Compliance at LexisNexis Risk Solutions, he now works as an independent financial crime consultant and advisor in the areas of anti-money laundering and anti-bribery and corruption risk. So now you know the panelists a bit more, please note that there will be Q&A at the end for you to ask away anything that springs to mind following the conversation or any burning questions you may have. So just to get dive straight in, um, you know, we've seen with recent events that the world seems to be constantly changing and we really just don't know what's going to happen next. A pace with that is the regulatory landscape. We've seen this with the FCA news just last week and the rules that are trying to keep up, not least with challenger banks and fintech. So let's set the scene here. How is the, regula how is the regulation evolving today? I think Mike and Craig, if you'd like to get... Yeah, sure. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you. And, and hello, everyone. Um, I can't see you, but I know you're there. <laughs> So um, I will press on and uh, speak to my computer screen, as we're all very familiar with these days. Um, so if, if we had the first slide up, we'll start with a quick look at how AML regulation has evolved and, and, and what's been driving it. So it's a fairly busy slide here, but um, I'm trying to show what I call the genesis of AML regulation. And uh, really, you know, it's been with us for a fairly short time, just over 20 years, although it does seem like it's forever for anybody that's been working in AML compliance in recent years. Um, so I show here uh, two elements, really. The Financial Action Task Force, FATF, uh, which is the body, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, who provides detailed guidance that, um, that comes out of FATF from time to time to the member countries that are all part of the organization. Um, and that's a substantial number of countries around the world that has increased significantly over the years. And of course, it includes all the major financial centers. So we have FATF defining and setting the general policy in what's called the 40 recommendations. We also have, and I'm showing here, what were known, what are known as the money laundering directives. So the UK, of course, for most of this period was part of the EU. And throughout that period, the um, UK money laundering regulations have been uh, framed by the money laundering directives that have come from um, the EU at different times over the years. And there have been significant milestones in that journey. I'm not going to go into any detail here, but you can see on the screen the kind of things that have been driving the changes to regulation over that period of time. And I think what you would see um, quite simply is that it's events, it's evolving criminal activity, it's money laundering, it's terrorist financing, it's corruption, organised crime, transparency issues, which of course came out of the revelations such as the Panama Papers. In other words, the criminal fraternity exploiting the financial system 
finding weaknesses and then uh, using and capitalizing upon those, followed by a regulatory activity to shore the system up and make it uh, more difficult to, to bypass. So we're seeing here a, a picture that has emerged of more regulation as the years have gone on. And really that is not likely to change. As you can see, top right, 2022, we are now in the UK at a point where there are there have been two consultations happening with AML regulation. Uh, they're likely to, to be reported on later this summer. And undoubtedly from that, we will see changes to the UK's AML framework in the next 12 months or so. Same thing in the EU, same thing in the USA, and certainly other parts of the world. In other words, more regulation, uh, not less, is likely to be the trajectory going forward. And of course, all that combination of all of that has led to a number of compliance challenges in escalating compliance costs um, and poor efficiency in the sense that obviously the answer to a lot of this has been to put more resource into AML compliance re uh, activities. Um, and a lot of that, as research shows, has been in people related costs as opposed to technology. And we'll come back to that obviously as a, as a key theme as we go on. So most financial service organizations are facing three challenges. One is all about efficiency. One is about effectiveness. How effective is the system at actually detecting um, financial crime and, and actually detecting it early to actually take some preventative action? And we have to say that all the figures show that not very good is the short answer to that. But it's also led to the regulators um, bringing something that's been around for a long time in terms of approach, which is the risk-based approach, and firms are concerned with efficiency and speed of onboarding. So the answer to this, of course, must be in better use of data, data analytics, and technology, and something that the FCA itself um, has recognized, as you can see on the slide here, which is really telling us that um, the FCA recognized that in doing what we do in terms of effective risk-based approach to customer due diligence needs good risk intelligence. And this statement from FCA Financial Crime Guide reinforces that and suggests that as well as local knowledge, open source internet checks are needed to supplement existing more traditional ways of doing that customer due diligence. So that just gives us a sort of setting um, of where we are now, where the regulatory uh, direction has gone and the challenges that we have. So I'd like just to pack, hand back to my panel members. Anything else that you'd like to add to this? Craig, perhaps uh, you could comment. Yeah, thank you, Mike. And um, I suppose to give a, a sort of very operational perspective then on the implications of these mounting regulations, um, you know, I work with clients in the context of helping them manage the risk associated with doing business with certain third parties and fulfilling and meeting these various regulations in addition to others, which I will reference shortly, actually. And I think the critical observation for me is in line with mounting regulation, you're all, we've also been seeing over the time period that Mike showed on that slide, such a significant and exponential growth of online intelligence and, and OSINT generally. And, you know, businesses have been grappling with two challenges. One, how do we effectively ensure that we meet these regulatory obligations? But then two, how do we do this amongst the wealth of online intelligence that's available uh, and do it in an effective way and sort of meet what the good practice here on the left-hand side of this slide particularly shows? And, you know, I think organizations' ability to harness OSINT has probably been one of the fundamental challenges during this time period. And it's where technology really has become critical in the last couple of years. I think in addition to some of the traditional AML regulations that Mike was mentioning as well, what we of course are seeing in the last couple of years in particular are additional regulations around things such as, you know, modern slavery with the Modern Slavery Act in the UK, and then the EU supply chain directive, which is going to bring additional burden on um, organizations. And, you know, in the past, there are traditional data sets out there that cover things such as sanctions risk, as you will know, you know, political exposure and the risk of bribery, corruption, and things like financial crime related risk areas. But there are certainly not 
significant volumes of data sources out there that are facilitating and catering those new emerging risk domains. And I think that's where OSINT then becomes even more important to make sure that you are um, utilizing it to meet those risks um, and, and to show that you're demonstrating you're addressing the risk effectively. Um, you know, and I think the other trend for me, and, and this is certainly many of you will have seen if you're from a financial services background in, in recent years, regulation best practices driving organizations to consider how they respond to risk in a proactive way. So instead of reactively finding things and then addressing it, mitigating it, remediating it, whatever the context may be, you know, being much more proactive around your risk identification and, and almost event-driven risk management. Um, and historically, you know, that might have been done by some organizations purely from a, you know, a Google News update where they got new Google News results every day. Uh, look, and we all know the limitations of relying on Google solely uh, and not sort of utilizing broader, you know, sent capabilities. Um, but, you know, what we are seeing now is, you know, technologies such as Neotask, which provide the monitoring capability across all data sets, you, you know, whether, whether it be premium content providers, and then bringing in some of the things alongside social media, open source intelligence sources, such as litigation sites, other things like that, so that you can move to a much more proactive model of risk management, an event driven risk management, which, you know, has two benefits, really, I think it's one an operational efficiency benefit, you're no longer spending time on the entities that don't warrant it if they're not driving any sort of risk profile change to your organization and to the, um, the, the sort of cost benefit as well of that, um, that that sort of naturally comes as a result of doing it in a more sort of proactive and event driven manner so uh, yeah I think it's a, it's a bit of a double whammy from an organizational perspective the regulation challenges are mounted so has the volume of data and, and I think that's where technology plays a sort of critical linchpin between the two. Thanks so much, Craig. Thanks, Mike. I think it sounds like there's quite a lot to keep ahead of and it's an ever moving feast. Um, so we're all very busy and it sounds like just a lot of additional responsibility for people to keep abreast of. Good thing that, you know, Neotas was ranked one of the best in class in RegTech by Planet Compliance. But um, you mentioned, alluded to that just now, Craig, in terms of technology. Um, next question to the panel is, what is the role of data and technology and namely OSINT? What makes OSINT so powerful? I'll maybe go first on this one and I'll maybe bring you in Vipal afterwards. Um, so for me, technology is crucial to sort of provide a centralized platform to harness OSINT. Um, you, you know, in my experience, you know, having a platform which centralizes, it brings out operational efficiency in terms of doing those searches. And whilst I still consider myself at a tender age, uh, despite my body telling me otherwise, you know, I, I've been doing this for 15 years and I remember when I first started doing intelligence and due diligence work, where genuinely I was going from one company website to a litigation website to a sanctions and PEP source. I was maybe actually, you know, awfully 15 years ago printing evidence. I was then taking a highlighter. I was highlighting the relevant stuff and annotating it by pen. You know, you just by listening to me, you can understand how challenging, time consuming that was and actually how prone those processes are to human error, inconsistency, oversight. And I think that's where technology has so evolved in this space, where it sort of acts as that centralized platform and nexus to bring together your, you know, your OSINT sources on top of your premium content sources and bring it together in a way in which you can harness it really effectively no longer needing you know separate spreadsheets for project plans and audit trails you know files to demonstrate what you did and what decision making you had you know it provides that full sort of front to end workflow to generate not only time saving and cost saving but also um you know a more comprehensive you know you know regulatory uh, compliance activities which is obviously where, where you want to sort of focus your efforts in terms of what you're doing. So, you know, having technology that sort of acts as a one-stop shop to that is really effective. You know, as, as Isabella said in my intro, I've also had the pleasure of working on some genuinely fascinating open source intelligence investigations in my time and looking for things such as network analysis or connectivity between people has been such a laborious thing where you can sometimes be maintaining 
databases or Excel spreadsheets with VLOOKUPs and things like that to identify connections. And I think the development of things like graph analysis, network analysis has again just heightened what an, an investigator can do in terms of spotting trends, risk indicators or things like that in a much more proactive way and an efficient way, which is, which is crucial. You know, and, and in my experience of, of sort of using technologies in this space, it, it can genuinely save you between 60, 70% time saving of your research process by harnessing a platform that allows you to centralize all of this in one space. Um, you know, so for, from my perspective, it's all about doing things comprehensively and effectively, um, but, but also giving, giving you the comfort that, that you're also, uh, you know, meeting best, best practice. But Vipul, I'll maybe bring you in at this point because I know you have some interesting observations given your background. Great. No, th thanks, Craig. Yeah, so as you know, my, my background is very different to, uh, I've always been on the reactive side. I've, I've spent my life uh, investigating quite a lot of complex uh, fraud cases, financial crime, computer crime cases. I think what I've seen uh, that the trend of the uh, the type of cases I've been investigating, the nature of the criminal cases that now I investigate has become very international. It has become very complex as opposed to 20 years ago. And I think that's the reason the regulators are changing. Whenever I see a trend in the type of cases I'm investigating, I see a few months down the line or years down the line, the regulators are saying that, hey, you need to do more. Uh, I mean, what I'm seeing is the digital methods, especially in the emerging economies, you know, where uh, people can pay by their mobile number, they have e-wallets, they have crypto and all these things. All these things are making it very easy for criminals to hide their true identities in a very complex digital chain spanning across various jurisdiction. So the life for criminals are becoming easier because they've got a lot more new funky ways to keep money and transfer money. And that means the life for financial crime specialists is becoming harder because they have to get all this information and the tools they have is just the traditional databases, corporate cost, directorship, PEP and sanction adverse. And by the way, criminals have these tools as well so they can screen themselves on those databases before they commit a crime. Um, so yeah, I, I purely come from cybersecurity background. That's in my DNA. So one of the questions probably is, well, I don't know what's the uh, score at the moment, how many people are using or not using OSINT, but uh, for, for some of you who may not be aware of OSINT is, I come from a cybersecurity background, it's in my DNA, and there's a science called OSINT, which is effectively doing the reconnaissance before we do our cyber attack. Basically, the more you know about your target, the better you can plan your attack. So simply put, OSINT is uh, open source intelligence. Uh, it's a combination of tools and techniques that are used to interrogate all openly available information and then triangulate the key information that you're looking for uh, by discovering the digital footprints and then joining the dots between them and then cutting through the noise. So basically, how do you gather the intelligence from the openly um, available databases, basically? And um, when I pull, pull when I when I got pulled into the com compl uh, navigating complex fraud and financial crime cases, 70% uh, of the cases I investigated I found that uh, um, the open source, uh, through the open source intelligence, I was able to find the risk indicators that were there pre-breach uh, that could have been picked up by ha harnessing the power of open source intelligence. And all those risk indicators were missed by traditional uh, screening process. So that's the power of OSINT to answer your question, as well as 70% of the cases I investigated on the reactive side could have been prevented if OSINT was used. So that's the power I saw of OSINT, which was used in my days heavily in cybersecurity. And hence, I thought that's mind boggling. 70% is a big number. Uh, and the question was, how can I make it a norm? It's a super specialist skill. Effectively, you needed 20 years of experience to do that and quite a lot of time. So yeah, so the mission and the vision was basically, how can we make OSINT a norm? How can we bring OSINT to masses? And that, that's the power of OSINT was huge, I realized in 20 years. Uh, and that's how Neotas was born, basically. How can, how can I just make it faster, efficient, uh, using technology, uh, consistent, like Craig said, auditable, compliant, all these factors technology actually brings into play to, to harness the power in a very slick, compliant, efficient manner, effectively. So ultimately, you're saving the cost. You're doing more, saving the, saving the cost, so you can focus on the real risk and cut through the noise, basically. Fascinating. Thanks so much, Vipul and Craig, for walking us through that. 70% um, of uh, people in the 
poll have actually responded and yes to currently using OSINT has now overtaken the responses. So it's 60, 40, uh, which is great. Um, you know, more adoption, more people harnessing that, that power and that efficiency, as we've just mentioned. So quite conscious of time and we do have an exciting demo coming up. So, um, but I'm also quite conscious that we have one of the big four with us. And so for such a large firm, Craig, um, such as PwC, how can technology provide a centralized efficient structure for people to apply OSINT efficiently and cost effectively? Yeah, sure. And, and from my perspective, and those of you are from a compliance background on the call, um, you know, I think you will probably, hopefully, resonate with what I'm about to say. But, um, you know, for me, I want my team focusing on the risks. I want them to spend their time on risk identification, risk analysis, and how we report that back to the relevant stakeholders. That's the value that you add. You, you know, the, the ability to search and find stuff, that's where technology plays its important role in getting that into the hands of your analysts quickly. The value you add that your analysts have, whether it be in your financial services institution or within your compliance function from a non-FS perspective, is really in the time that they spend doing the risk analysis. So that was my sort of single mentality when always looking at technology from this perspective and how do we sort of implement it and, and, and why does it provide that structure? But, you know, if I give some interesting examples, I've had the pleasure of working on many different cases, both from an FS and non-FS perspective in terms of where this goes wrong and, and why, it, why, why, why clients need a technology like this. And to maybe bring that to life of, um, of how uh, you can do it cost effectively. I, I, there was one particular client I was working with and as part of their AML checks on customers, they were undertaking uh, fairly straightforward Google searches. And within their operational procedures, they would have had a policy to say, search the customer name alongside these keywords, various financial crime related words. Um, and, you know, maybe look up to the first 10 or first 20 results, for example. And the one thing that we found with that approach was what it was doing was driving such inconsistent results analyst by analyst because the same individuals had the ability to go and do their own personal shopping or browsing at lunchtime. And the order in which results were being returned varied significantly analyst by analyst, dependent on their own browser history, search patterns, et cetera. And it wasn't giving a true reflection of the potential risks. And they couldn't demonstrate a consistent, auditable, and efficient exercise across that organization. And that, for me, is something that I see so often. Um, and you know, with, with technology um, like Neotas, the ability to bring in OSINT into one platform manage all of your your sort of negative keywords or risk domains that you're looking at in different ways but making it consistent across all analysts is just you know absolutely crucial and the sort of scale of your organization or the scale of your operations almost becomes somewhat negligible because the technology sort of makes that easier for you because it does the hard work in terms of driving the consistency driving the approach and, and your analysts somewhat don't need to think about it. They need to be very aware of what they're doing and what, what is happening, but they don't need to think of the potential risks or errors or human errors that they would make if they were doing these searches manually. So, you, you know, from my perspective, in, in terms of implementing technology like this, it's, it's, been, it's been really refreshing to see how you can bring such a wealth of different sources together, how you can do it in a consistent way, and I suppose how proactively and positively analysts respond to it, you, you know, as I mentioned from, from a sort of leadership perspective, I want my analysts to spend their time on risk identification and analysis. Likewise, they want to spend their time on risk identification and analysis. So anything that makes their life easier and allows them to get into the detail of the risk of an issue, that's what they want to do. And, and similarly, you know, that's what motivates them. So. Um, that sort of technology driven approach, you know, for me, it's been, been really, really, really interesting, um, you know, and it sort of plays a, plays a very pivotal role in what we do now and what we will do going forward as this evolves. You know, I think one of the things that I mentioned earlier, 
was the sort of expansion of various risk domains that we are assessing for different clients, you know, most notably ESG and, you know, the ability to extend your own and searches to include new risk domains, whether it be ESG, financial solvency or other related matters is very crucial. Um, and again, by using technology, you can very much more easily scale your operations to incorporate these new risk domains, which I think is crucial. You know, with without technology, scaling to address new risk domains, address new compliance reg regulatory requirements becomes more challenging. Um, you know, so that's probably is about some of my key observations in terms of, of practically doing this and what it means for for myself and, and the team as such. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, that's you know, super interesting. And yeah, as you highlighted, the technology can be applied multiple uh, risk lenses, you know, such as ESG, which is the area I'm specializing in. But, you know, and of course, Neotas, we're, you know, delighted to be partnering with PwC in your fight against financial crime. And um, yeah, we're, we're quite excited. And I'm interested to also have a walkthrough now of how we've used it in practice. Um, so Vipul, I think you've got some exciting case studies to show us. Sure, sure, absolutely. Thanks as well. It's, uh, so uh, we, we do thousands of cases every month and we have uncovered hundreds and hundreds of uh, new risks that were not uncovered uh, using the traditional processes. And uh, some of the really interesting case studies, we, we get it week after week that can be in the front page of any newspaper. But uh, let me walk you through um, uh, two or three case studies uh, to start with. Um, so I'm going to talk about this uh, where we actually found a uh, fortster basically who had uh, a hidden identity to avoid being detected. So let, let me walk you through how we actually found it. So this was an individual to whom a loan uh, was to be given by a big financial institution for a decent sized loan. Um, this individual was supposedly from the UK. He had all the documents and addresses and all the traditional checks all the way from, uh, you know, all, all the credit checks and traditional PEP sanction things, he was completely clear on effectively. So we, the case came to us, we did some enhanced due diligence using open source intelligence. And then what we found was this individual had registered a domain name using a different email address a while ago. Well, that's not a crime. People can have domains, people can have multiple email addresses, that's all right, but we found a new email address. Now, when we conducted the research on that, the platform actually took um, that email address and found uh, further information. And we found there was a different LinkedIn account connected to this email address. And no two people on the planet can have the same email address. So it was his. And uh, this email address are connected to LinkedIn profile, which talked about the employment in US, the location in US, and a completely different name, well, a different surname. So now suddenly we realize, hang on, the, this person has got a different identity. He used to be live in US, he has got a different surname and he had different employment. So now the checks were carried out, the same checks that were carried out before that resulted green with a new set of information, the same check revealed that actually he was struck by FINRA. He was convicted, he was arrested, he was in jail. He flew to UK, he changed his surname, and there was another individual in the UK, a gentleman had no criminal record, so he was almost taking over his identity because of which all these checks were cleared. Um, so yeah, of course, our client uh, canceled the loan, and because of the severity of this, this was referred to FCA as well, which is interesting. Uh, but what we actually found, this individual is still operating in the UK under the new false identity. He has currently got six more companies since we carried out the investigation. And I'm assuming those companies have got bank accounts and other places. I'm assuming this person has been cleared and operating other six companies in the UK since we carried out the investigation. So that goes to show that how new companies that he has formed since has been cleared through all the checks as well, which could have been uncovered using OSINT again. Um, so yeah, this was one interesting case study. Uh, when like the platform thing which you're talking about, Although when I show it on the slide, it looks quite simple, but the platform actually find all this different domain of information, whether it's from corporate registry, adverse PEP and sanction, legal records, social networks, LinkedIn. The platform was able to bring everything into one central place. So you can actually spot that common email addresses, common surnames and employments and things for an analyst to actually spot a uh, focus on the risk rather than trying to pull all this information in different Excel sheet and like uh, Craig said, putting all the V lookups and things as well. Another case study, it's about uh, uh, hairdresser. So this was a wealth management um, institution. Uh, there was a, there was a uh, person, she 
opened uh, basically an account with them for fund management and thing. And uh, she was a founder of a hair salon. She was clear through all the traditional check, all good. So nothing to worry about. She was, uh, she's gone through all the PEP and everything for relative close associates. But then when we conducted social media open source analysis, we actually found that she has got a husband she had not disclosed about. And that husband was living overseas. So then the investigation was carried out on this close associate in a different jurisdiction, in a different language. Again, this is where the power of technology comes into place. The all it was a completely different jurisdiction and different language. The analyst didn't speak, but using machine learning and open source intelligence techniques and platform, our analyst was able to conduct the research in a completely different language, just like a native person would do. I'm not talking about translating the results, I'm talking about conducting the native research. And then we found that actually this husband when we conducted the research, was actually be convicted for money laundering. He was charged with murder. And I mean, really, really serious case. He was associated with Karloff politicians in that country as well. But this person's name is not on any PEP database in any RCA relative of close associates. Uh, so that was interesting that obviously the wealth manager declined the uh, money for this individual and saved some regulatory nightmare and fines. Um, the other thing that technology can help you is monitor the same thing. Once you have done all the cases in one single platform, the platform can actually monitor all those things for you. So we have another financial institution, um, loan institution, trade finance. We did a company for them. People change, circumstances change. So initially the company was all clean, all good, but this company was set on monitoring using the platform and the online footprint of the company suddenly started revealing on some of the blogs. Within a week, there were a huge amount of negative reviews appearing on the internet that were processed by natural language processing, suggesting there are some financial issues going on. People complaining about the money not being re returned and everything. And then the website suddenly went down as well within a week. So that was quite an instant trigger for, because the platform was monitoring the portfolio company, that something is going on. So they contacted them, they retrieved the money in time because they acted fast. And after a few weeks and months, the company actually started the bankruptcy proceeding. So this was again using the power of open source intelligence. Not only you can save your time and add efficiency, you can save money if you're a trade finance company and basically retrieve your loan over there. So yeah, this is one of the interesting case study. Like I said, uh, the technology massively helped um, the analysts to be upskilled by using the language capabilities, the monitoring capabilities, joining the dots across disjointed databases aggregating all the information, whether it's corporate records, adverse PEP and social media into one single place because of which we are able to solve these crimes, which are very difficult to do if you do it manually and they are very tedious and takes weeks and months if you do it manually as well. Yeah, some of the case studies for me. Incredible. Um, yeah, so, you know, it just goes to show not only can it sort of save financial risk, but, you know, there's reputational risk at hand as well. And obviously all the regulatory risk we need to keep abreast of to keep the uh, business running. Um, if anyone has any, you know, questions so far, please put it in the Q&A box, which is, um, should be at the bottom of your screens. But that sort of dandelion diagram as well is just an incredible visualization, isn't it, of how everything is so interconnected. And even when we look at social media, for example, I mean, someone's connections can span into the sort of thousands, depending on what platform we're looking into. And it's really interesting to kind of dig deep into those and uh, see who's linked and, and then pick up any sort of, uh, follow that through the relationships, um, if there's any sort of clues to be found. And obviously I guess we know with the case around, you know, convicted criminals or, any sort of violent individuals and they're convicted murderer and you know you kind of hope these cases are few and far between yeah you know it's kind of the power of those can really uncover a lot and i know a lot of people are thinking oh gosh what's what's out there about me and my digital footprint um especially as generations are getting living more of their lives online now but we really hope not to find as many of these cases because it's quite um it, it can be quite shocking but you know when, when they do come up it's it's great for the client and it's great just to know um in order to avoid uh, any any issues and engagements with these um, entities and individuals going forward. And I think, um, you know, so, and I guess the first question a lot of people think about when we are investigating, especially individuals, is sort of, with you know, without their knowledge, what are the sort of concerns or risks that, um, you know, come to mind when, before we use the power of OSINT for these due diligence cases? I guess that's an open question to the panel, really. You know, 
I guess, is there any, especially with GDPR and in sort of data protection, what are the sort of um, legalities of doing such, such in-depth investigation? Yeah. Perhaps I can just kick us off on that one, Isabella, and say that obviously one of the frequently heard concerns from people that uh, might think they'll be overwhelmed with data, uh, that's clearly an issue because, you know, we're talking about, as both Craig and Vipul have said, you know, a, a, a mass of data that's available to us through these tools that wasn't before, you know, traditional techniques didn't have access to this. So there is a sense that I'm going to be overwhelmed with data. Well, I think one of the important things to remember, of course, is that the way that the platform works and an OSINT um, workflow works is that um, irrelevant data noise is kept away from the user interface so that what is coming to you actually is usable. And that's important in two respects. One is obviously from an efficiency perspective, um, you don't want to be spending um, uh, wasted time looking at the wrong things as an analyst, clearly. Uh, the other thing, of course, is concern that I might be receiving into my working environment data that will put me it, perhaps in contravention of some data privacy uh, issue. And I think we need to also just sort of talk about that. And I'm not an expert in data privacy, but we all understand that when we're using data for um, financial crime compliance purposes, AML, anti-bribery and corruption, whatever that compliance purpose is, then that is a legitimate interest. So you know, clearly we, we have to have that information. We have to be able to work with it in order to fulfill our compliance obligations. And of course, to find the bad guys, find the, 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 the hidden needle in the haystack, because really that's what everybody is, is trying to do. Um, and, you know, I've heard said, heard said to me, and it's hard to believe, but, you know, I'd rather not find the hidden needle because it just means a lot more work for us. Um, the reality is, of course, that, you know, the, as I said at the beginning, the emphasis on the risk-based approach, the, the need to become more effective in all of our due diligence processes, our customer due diligence, whatever the use case, whatever the outcome is, is that, you know, criminals are smarter, uh, tech savvy, use our traditional systems to their advantage and you know we are basically uh, disarmed or operating with one arm behind our backs if we don't have access to tools that can uncover the hidden risks so you know the fact that there's obviously this is accessing the deep web it's going into social media it's pulling a lot of information but that then becomes very usable very powerful and uh, protects us from, you know, the issues I said about, you know, the, the way it's st structured from from uh, being overwhelmed and being in breach of some sort of data privacy. So I think there, there are legitimate concerns around that and we do need to address them. But, you know, this is designed to obviously protect the, the, the analysts from that world. So Vipul, please, you know, jump in on that. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Completely agree. I think uh, data, I come from a subsidy and legal background. So, uh, as I mentioned, it's about efficiency, effectiveness, and compliance is a big thing, whether it's a financial compliance or a data protection compliance, effectively. And I think technology can massively help you achieving, achieving that privacy as well. If you have no records of when you are uh, searching a customer, if someone, if you all have biases, we human have biases quite a lot. So if you're searching using traditional means and there's no record, there's no auditability, there's no consistency, then there are quite a lot of chances you'll be caught by someone saying that, hey, you researched me more than that person. Why did you add these words in my research, not in that? But if you use a centralized platform in a very consistent manner, then you can actually say, you know what, we conduct our research in a consistent manner. And by the way, they are all the proof. You don't have to dig up the browser history for different people's thing. Like Michael mentioned, we have a lot of use cases this is a financial crime uh, webinar, but uh, the same techniques are heavily used for HR background screening. We have many clients where the traditional background screening planet is changing. It's not just about criminal record and education and employment verification. It's about personality, character, behavior, which can cause serious workplace safety issues. You know, the Black Lives Matters, the Meet Movements, and all these things have proven that um, that you need to uh, get people um, for purely from workplace. So we do heavily for HR and vendor due diligence and investment due diligence, it doesn't matter what the use case is, it's about legitimate interest. So you need to do your data protection impact assessment right at the beginning 
And again, if you do it through system, you can set a methodology for the screening process based on a data production impact assessment. So you're doing it in a consistent manner. You have justified each and every step. And that's where you can prove your legitimate interest if you do it in a very compliant, thorough manner. If you're doing it on a random manner, people going to Facebook, LinkedIn, and Google will definitely end up, will end up in a hot soup uh, from data privacy and FCA compliance for a few years. Well. So yeah, things can be done in a private manner. As you saw, the FCA compliance themselves, regulations themselves are saying to do it, but do it correctly. And that's where technology can massively help you, help you to do it. Thanks for pulling. Thanks, Mike. That's that's clear. I think following on from that, you know, we've touched on social media, and I think just following on from your point just now, Vipul, we do have a question from the audience. So, uh, Sylvia Willos, question to Vipul: Public awareness on privacy, data sharing, data protection is increasing, and so is the ability of level of managing what people share on the internet, which is changing. So, stricter security settings, less ability to share personal information. Um, with that in mind, you know, how do you think this will impact the value of SOCMINT as part of OSINT research in the future? I think that the, yes, absolutely. And I'm glad to, to, to see the actual awareness increasing, uh, but still this inform the total amount of information available to us online is exploding at the same time. So the good thing is people, I mean, I'm from the older generation where I used to write a notebook and actually if someone reads my personal notebook, I used to go mad. But now I see the generation where they write things on the blog and they get mad if you don't read it, right? So the psychology and the, of this information sharing and awareness and people saying, oh, I've been to the restaurant, just liking it. I can't, you know, it's not from my generation point of view. People are putting information out there. So there's the amount of information awareness is massively exploding. The good thing is the social media companies are becoming aware that so that you can uh, control what's private and what's public. So people are becoming more aware and they're closing the private thing. And those are the private thing we are not supposed to use in our due diligence anyway. And the technology is geared for that. But at the same time, the amount of public information available is increasing as well. So I don't see that as a hurdle. In fact, day after day, we are seeing more and more information being available rather than less information being available online, but good information, not private information. Understood. So yeah, just more data to uh, look into and connect the dots, I suppose. Um, we've also got another question, uh, David Lean. So Vipul, how can OSINT be applied to other sectors? We've kind of mentioned ESG, and obviously there's the sanctions risk going on at the moment, but what other sort of sectors? You mentioned child protection as well. Um, like I said, I, I come from some security, doing OSINT for 20 years and that, but now within the last five years, I've seen um, literally everything. Uh, we, we work for a charity, charity as well. Uh, like you said, child protection, there's quite a lot of due diligence done on the volunteers because unfortunately, when there's a disaster, uh, few people go missing and then volunteers go and we found that more people went missing because those volunteers weren't really checked, screened clearly as well. So we, we, we work for that. We are used for investment due diligence, HR background screening as well. Like I said, work with safety issues. Uh, the range is immense. Fundamentally, you're trying to assess KYC normally, I say, know your client, know your vendor, know your employee. And I think just by matching the records, it's VYC, as I call it, very fine. So, uh, it should be KYC, no, no is how the younger generation do. They pull out the phone, they go on the internet to get to know the connected trusted party rather than just checking the database. So yeah, it's applicable um, to many, many sectors and we don't care what the use case is. It's just a different risk domain that you're analyzing. And that's again where technology helps you. So if you're using technology, you're focused on that risk domain rather than trading on other toes. If you're using customer due diligence, their private life is irrelevant to you. And then the OSINT platform can help gear your searches for that risk domain, whether it's HR, ESG, or vendor due diligence. Yeah, if you don't mind, if you don't, I was gonna say, if you don't mind, Isabella, just to give another perspective on this. Um, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with lots of different clients in lots of different industries as well. And the benefit of having a technology-driven approach is that, regardless of the industry of the target or your client um, and the risk domains that you're looking for, the technology driven approach allows you to tailor that effectively. You, you know, you can build a structure around it, you can build a robust research methodology, you can build taxonomies that can then much more easily be adapted to whatever situation, either risk or industry that you're looking at. So, you know, I think for any of you, in the audience that are working across multiple sectors, use cases or industries, utilizing technology just further, you know, enables that process in a, in a much sort of slicker manner. 
Thanks, Greg. And I think, yeah, following on from that, you know, um, do you have any sort of advice for other firms looking to integrate an OSINT solution, um, maybe specifically into FinCrime and AML, if uh, just to make it more narrow for the conversation today? Yeah, I think it'll keep an open mind. Mike made me a really good point earlier where there is this fear of the, the volumes of irrelevant content or false positives and things like that. And I think that's something that always comes to mind, particularly for AML and FinCrime specialists. But what you want to leverage technology for is the ability to um, do that more effectively. You know, so the natural language processing capabilities within Neotas, the graph and network analysis capabilities. Whilst you're looking at more content, the underlying technology allows you to analyze that much more effectively and time efficiently. So, you know, don't be you know, don't don't just think, oh, okay, I'm looking at more stuff. I'm going to get more things back that my team are going to become overwhelmed by. That's not the case. Technology has come on quite significantly in that space. So don't let that be your natural deterrent. I would say keep an open mind. Look at what the technology does. Look at all the different use cases across your organization, or you know, whether it be you know initial front line of defense, your investigation unit, or other components, and see well, how could this technology be tailored in different ways to meet those different needs and purposes? So, yeah, I think an open mind and um, you, you know, really getting under and understanding the technological capability that's out there at the moment is, is really crucial to, to successful implementation. Absolutely, thanks so much, Craig. I think, yeah, you know knowing what we know or knowing what's out there and it's almost not worth not knowing um you know OSINT is, is super helpful and, and powerful for anyone to to try and implement and um yeah it should definitely be a part of some almost every process and as we can see for for multiple sectors and going back to the sort of ongoing monitoring platform that uh, neotas have we've got a question from the audience here as well what um what sort of traditional databases sort of world check etc can, can this platform link into um so currently the platform is uh, hooked into pretty much uh, most of the well-known risk databases out there uh, whether it's a world check and audience and and many other databases and it's also linked into many corporate records as well um so like pvds and of the world and specialist data provider from specialist jurisdictions as well uh, to be honest, that's the easy bit. Uh, we've done that. We've got that. And, but there are the other platforms that can pull that into uh, uh, pull that information as well. But the way the power of the platform comes in is actually uh, cutting the noise for the platform, so reducing the time, so that the analysts don't have to go to corporate records and get the list of beneficiary and shareholders, and then put in world check, and then taking it there and putting Dow Jones, and then taking it to Google. You don't have to do that. You bring everything together. So effectively, the platform becomes aggregator of aggregators and then joining the dots and removing the false positive and cutting through the noise. So yeah, so there are plenty of databases that are, and the list keeps on increasing um, every week, basically. Great. Yeah, I'm seeing lots of benefits with the with the platform, you know, it's not only efficiency and the multiple languages that we can tap into and, and do investigations in, um, you know, the fully auditable, explainable trail that the investigation leaves behind with the sources that we're using and um, the customer experience, you know, um, being able to navigate and connect these dots and that knowledge, you know, knowledge is power and the cost savings, as we've said, so not only the cost savings of inputting such a system or, or platform, but also avoiding risks down the line that we've uncovered. Um, but yeah, you know, I think if anyone has any other questions, then we can probably wrap up shortly. Um, there is something, oh no, we've just got another one from the audience about charging structures and whether it's subscription-based per search or per, per report um, and how much work is required to integrate such a platform into existing customer systems. Is this affordable for smaller entities, for example? Um, I think the, net, uh, the, the whole point we started the company was because these investigations were expensive if we account the internal time and the losses and the fines and everything. Um, so definitely, if you do the return on investment, that's the whole point of the platform to to bring uh, to add to, to add to your bottom line. So you're you're not losing um, money by giving bad loans and you're reducing the time of investigations. That's the whole point of it. So because even even if you're using the traditional databases through the platform, there's a huge time saving. 
Uh, even if you're running the same queries directly in World Checks and Bureau, and like if you do it through the platform, there's a huge amount of time saving as well. You don't necessarily need to integrate if you want uh, the speed to onboard is really quick. Uh, you can just start using the platform as an isolated system if you want to, just to you know get going. Uh, but yeah, there, there's fully API driven, so you can actually connect into your in internal systems through APIs as well. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's fairly quick, very intuitive. That's the whole point. How can I upskill the analysts? How can we get these things done quicker? I think training and all that will be provided as well. So yeah, super easy, but you know, please do get in touch. There will, there will be a uh, follow-up email and a recording uh, shared with the audience uh, following the event. But you know, that's very um, easy to speak to a member of the team um, and book a meeting to answer any further questions you may have and also get a live demo for maybe a particular entity or, or individual that you're particularly interested in at the moment. Um, so if anyone has any other questions, we might shortly wrap up, but we've got a couple more minutes. So I don't know whether for the mic, you know, you've had, you've had so many years in this space, whether there's anything, um, you know, over the, over time that you've seen that's shocked you are things getting better or worse over that time span? Um, and are you, are you hopeful for the future? One is always has to be hopeful for the future, Isabella. The fact of the matter is the whole financial crime business is a sort of cat and mouse game you know it's it's all about um trying to get ahead of the evolving criminal methodologies that i spoke about at the very beginning that's really hard to do obviously in the sense that you know we're dealing with a smart community so there always will be testing of our systems and our vulnerability but what is encouraging to see is an acceleration of the way that data, data analytics and technology brought together can really transform the process. When I first you know, started in this business 20 years ago, you know, um, due diligence processes were very manual, very heavily reliant upon people, disparate data sources and an absence of data sources, you know, as 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 Craig talked about um, eloquently early on. So it's, it's just fantastic to see that evolution continue and you know it's, financial crime isn't going to disappear sadly so we've just got to get smarter and better and continue to embrace new technology and new ways of doing things as we've been talking about today so I feel very positive about that and right. long may that continue. It's so reassuring to hear Mike thank you so much and, and thank you to the panelists um, and thank you so much to the audience as well for your attention and all the questions and um, really looking forward to following up the conversation with um, with calls or meetings should you uh, wish to learn more about the, the platform and how, how we can integrate OSIN into, into your systems and processes. So keep in touch. Thank you so much for joining today and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.